Well, thank you very much for having me here today, or for the last two days. It's been an exceptional conference and a huge accolade to the Nuffield uh, Board and all of the past uh, people that have contributed to making it such an, an excellent um, movement. That's the way I see it. You're all moving forward in a very positive way rather than looking back and, um, and making life a little bit more difficult. So congratulations. Who am I and why am I standing here before a room full of scholars? I come from a background of a little bit of mixture. I grew up, well I was born to gem miners, but my mother's a thoroughbred breeder and I was the black sheep of the family. I always had this strange interest in beef cattle. So at the age of 14 I started my own shorthorn stud, which came through uh, as an opportunity of being away at boarding school and the school had a beef cattle program and it's something that shaped my life and gave me all sorts of opportunities to explore um, and find out who I was as an individual. Um, so later on in life, I married into uh, another shorthorn family and uh, as a result, I have two beautiful boys and uh, who are now, they're a little bit older than they are in those photos, but they're now 12 and 10 um, and had a, a wonderful property at Cumnock where uh, not only do we breed um, shorthorn stud stock, but also delved into crossbreeding program with Charolais Shorthorn Bulls. And in more recent times, I went down the path of trading after doing the KLR Marketing School and realised that uh, we had too much risk in the structure of the business that we had. And by trading, uh, we minimised the risk to us. Um, but as life goes on, um, I'm no longer married into that family and no longer have the farm, but that doesn't define um, my life. Everything's about where you go to in the future. But I spent 11 years uh, working for the Little River Land Care Group in the central west of New South Wales. I spent seven years of those as the education manager and in that time I engaged with over 7,000 farmers. And um, not land care that most people expect land care is, is a, a greeny, you know, tree planting mob, but um, our organisation was really a sustainable ag organisation. So I delivered all sorts of programs across the range of um, soil carbon sequestration, grazing management, um, you know, farm water quality, uh, you know, pasture practices, cropping practices, you name it, uh, we've probably done it. Um, so I worked with a membership base of 570 farming businesses. We covered 320,000 hectares uh, and we had an active engagement rate of 78%. So it's one of Australia's leading land care organisations um, and in my time I've uh, worked with projects and managed projects in excess of $7 million. Um, in the lady, last three years of working for the River Land Care Group I was their CEO and in that time that's where I got to develop my governance skills, management skills, um, advocacy, um, strategy, financial management um, and of course managing a team of people which is always a lot of fun. Um, while I was with the Little River Land Care Group, so I slide early there, one of the things that I realised that we had this challenge, which was very frustrating as someone that was trying to encourage the change of practice, was that we could bring to the community a world expert who had all of the data, all of the scientific evidence, maybe even a little bit of altruistic reason why people should adopt a new practice. And how come people would go home and they didn't? But isn't it obvious? It's all, we've just laid it out all before you, but you're not doing it. Or there were the others. There was the ones that would go home and start to change, but down the track would revert back to past practice. <coughs> now Mick showed us that slide about the, the um, innovation curve. You know, and, and I look at it as more of a, a continuum. So we knew we had those people that were at the top 10% that would continuously move along that continuum. But what was going on with that other 70%? Because there's always the ones down the end that you can never change. So you don't waste too much energy on those ones. So my frustration was about that middle 70%. <coughs> a couple of years ago, about three years ago, a family, uh, sorry, a farming family I was very close friends with, still am, had a major conundrum that happened in their family. Now they had spent, in the four years prior to this major crisis, in excess of $80,000 with farming consultants trying to improve their business, improve the way that they did business. And they were making some significant leaps forward. 
However, the crisis happened. I had been suspicious that this one particular gentleman, it's three generations in the business, was suffering from depression. He became suicidal and it hit that family like a ton of bricks. They didn't see it coming. He had to be hospitalised and the grandfather, or well, his father, the older generation, who was in his 80s, together with the 19 year old just straight out of school, had to pick up into this business and try and make it function. And over a space of about four months, that business went back about eight years in the way that they managed their landscape, the way that they were managing their livestock, in the way that they were managing their funds, the way they were making decisions. I thought, it's not a function of money. Often we think if people invest money, then that they'll be changing and that's the great <coughs> outcome. It wasn't. It was this social problem that was sitting in there that had never been identified, that had never been addressed. Now, whether they subconsciously or consciously you know, were aware or unaware of the issue, it was there. So I thought, how are we going to manage this sort of stuff that sits and permeates underneath the surface and no one sees it coming? And in the natural resource management sector and the ag sector at that time, there was no avenues for funding this type of work. No one really was, and I'd probably go as far to say still is, interested in the soft system stuff that sits behind what drives um, adoption of best practice, what drives innovation, what drives people adopting natural resource management? You now, what drives people actually changing? So that's where Riddick came along, and it was very, very timely for me. So it has been this platform for me to undertake this exploration of, of this social conundrum that, I've, I've had, that I had identified, and it allowed me to put forward a project. And I'll talk to you a little bit further about the project shortly. But over the last 18 months, I've had the most extraordinary journey as the Rural Woman of the Year for New South Wales and, and nationally. One of the things that it's taught me is that 18 months, two years ago, I had a job. I had a job I loved. I got to see the rewards of my job every day by working with people and seeing small changes. And I learnt that 101% changes is just as effective as one 100% change. And sometimes that slow progress of change is so much better, it's so much more comfortable for families. I had to be patient and accept that. What I realise now, 18 months later, is I actually have a career. And that's a big thing for a female on farms, um, in the sector that we're in, to actually acknowledge that we have a career path. We often don't look at it that way. And so that's been a big shift in thinking for me. The other interesting aspect, and I would love to know how many scholars in the room find this same thing happen to you, but 18 months ago I had this idea. I wanted to know a little bit more about it. You know, and people would come to you and say, I'll oh, come and talk at our event, we'd love to know more about you and this amazing ward, so you go and do that. And then halfway through they're going, come and talk to us about what you found out so far about your, your project, so you go and do that. Now I'm getting asked to come and think, uh, talk to groups as a perceived expert. And I kind of go, what happened? You know, all I'm doing is looking into a topic. And I'm sure many scholars in this room probably can resonate with that, where you go on this great experience for a couple of years and then you come out the other end as um, a community brand expert. So it's a really interesting journey from that perspective. Um, this year, with the award, it's raised my profile, which I never would have asked for, but it's been an interesting experience having other people um, telling you how they view you, uh, whether you ask for it or not sometimes. But um, interestingly, I had our Minister for Primary Industries in New South Wales, Katrina Hodgkinson, who's our former minister, approach me to ask whether I would sit on her Primary Industries Minister Advisory Council. And I thought, well, that's an interesting request. I'm not sure if I'm of the calibre of the rest of her crew on that one, but she said, you have so much to give from such a different perspective. You're working in agriculture from a sustainable perspective, from the family resilience perspective. You know, it's such a crucial component. And I'm very fortunate that our new minister has re-invited me to, a, to stay on to that um, advisory council. Um, I was nominated or to be inducted into the Australian Business Women's Hall of Fame. Um, that was quite a confronting experience to have that phone call. Um, not as confronting as the phone call to be asked to feature in a cookbook. Uh, because anyone that knows me, I don't cook. I would make the worst CWA member. I don't knit, I don't cook, I don't 
dress dolls, I don't do any of that stuff, but that was very confronting getting a phone call being a cookbook. But this, the um, Australian Business Women's Hall of Fame, when you have a look at the women that have been inducted there, it, they're the most extraordinary group of women. Like there's Maggie Beers, Liz Davenports, there's executives from companies like Enyo and, um, oh goodness, Table of Plenty and all these extraordinary businesses started by women. And I said, why on earth would you want me on, like I haven't done anything to be recognised that way. And she said, no, when, when we explored all about you, what we found is this person that's contributed significantly to the governance of, a, of the natural resource management sector. It's someone that has promoted the role of women as key decision makers on farms. She said, so your impact is very significant. And uh, I said, well, leave it with me. I'll have a think about it. And you know, a few people nudged me and, and so I accepted. But I think it's through the Real Women's Award that that um, my profile has been heightened and, and people sort of approaching me for these very unusual um, roles. But um, I can't begin to tell you how many um, showgirls I've sashed, shows I've opened, uh, cake judges, judging I've done, I'd love to eat them, don't know anything about. You know, a lady said to me, you did notice that cake had a um, cooling rack mark on it? I said, I don't care. <laughs> Australia Day Ambassador this year for my local community, uh, featured in all sorts of magazines, but importantly I've been given the opportunity now to speak at over 13 conferences, which has meant that I've um, been able to engage with over 2,200 people, in, um, particularly in the last 12 months. Um, normally, most of the audience is female, so it's great in the last couple of months I'm starting to actually get to talk to the men as well. And because most of the women when I speak have come up straight afterwards and said, my husband or my son needs to hear this. I go, well, that's nice, but they're not here at a women's event. So what I'm finding, though, is as the talks I've given of recent, the men really resonate with this concept of what the social barriers are and are looking for help because they deem themselves as the leader in their families, but they don't know where to go to next. So... Um, I guess that's where now I'll tell you a little bit about my, my project, which is called Positive Farming Footprints. So, social barriers to progress. I ask you to think of a bucket, okay? And the bucket has a hole in it for each and every <coughs> social barrier that your family farming business is suffering from. And that bucket can only ever be as full as the lowest hole. These holes inhibit your business from ever reaching its full potential. So much so that 25% of the challenges that you will encompass every day, every year in your business, are social problems. So I wanted to explore, thinking behind this, what are these holes? You know, what makes up the bucket? And so I went out to find consultants around Australia that are in the world that are working directly with farming families and I wanted to find out what they're doing, what tools do they use to help farming families identify these social barriers and then deal with them. So I set off on an exploration. That's what my first reaction was. It's an exploration of thinking. So I wanted to have a look at two things in particular, holistic management and the trinity of management. Why did I choose these two things? Within holistic management, and it's a decision-making framework, it's not a grazing cult. Uh, within this decision-making fra framework, there's a number of educators around the world who actually have a real interest in the social element, in balance with, the way you do business, the economics of the business, the function of the landscape, all those aspects. So I wanted to go and have a chat with those pe people in particular. Trinity of Management, uh, which is the, the, the idea of a, a crazy Italian man called Ernesto Soroli, is about passion in business. And he works with family business, not necessarily agricultural businesses, but he goes in to try and find where's the passion deficit in the business and how do we help reinvigorate it so that that business not only becomes productive but also really profitable. So, and I'd speak to anyone else that wanted to talk to me. So I set off to New Zealand, Canada and the USA. And these are the key social factors that I found. Now some of these, um, I, I call them clusters, have actually a number of elements that sit within them. Um, so. What I want to emphasise is it's really important that we don't look at any one of these in isolation because they're all intricately connected with each other. 
So I'll give you, given I've got a very short space of time, a speed date to each and all of these um, little, little issues. So the first one is business acumen. <coughs> and I actually believe that this is one of our greatest challenges in agriculture, in particular for farming family businesses. So what is the concept of business acumen? Firstly, you must have a vision and purpose. Now, Isabel Knight yesterday in her talk from a succession planning perspective really highlighted you must know the purpose of your business. Now, I want to encourage you to think about it a little bit deeper than that. And this comes quite directly out of holistic management, is that you as an individual should know what the quality of life and what the purpose for your life is. And you should have that articulated. Then you should have another quality of life and a purpose for you and your spouse. Then you should have another one for your family. And then you have another one for your business. And they are nested. They connect intricately. And this is one of the greatest dynamics that we have in agriculture, is that not only are we families, we're also a farming business. And we have to remove the schizophrenia of the two, because that's kind of what happens at present in agriculture. We've got these two conflicting beasts that have two different voices and they confuse everyone. We need to meld them together, calm down the, the, the extra noise, and bring them so that they are connected together. And that purpose is what will guide your business, the decisions that you make in your family into the future. The other aspect is financial literacy, and this is a really important aspect. Recently up at Alice Springs, uh, a succession facilitator for Rabobank gave a wonderful presentation and she said less than 10% of her clients that come through to her through Rabobank for succession planning services have an acceptable level of financial literacy. That's hideous. It's, it's appalling that our industry has allowed itself to get to this state. So financial literacy is the ability to make an informed judgment and to take effective decisions regarding the use and management of our money. Now, I could give an hour's talk on just the concept of business acumen alone, so I'm jamming content very briefly here. It's like a little taste test. The other important aspect is strategic thinking. Strategic thinking is actually that concept of knowing what are the strengths that you have in your business and the weaknesses. It's about knowing your opportunities and it's about mitigating the threats to your business. And I've come across too many farming families who wouldn't have a clue about those four elements of their business. They wouldn't know where their strengths are, They're not, they have no idea, complete ambivalence about where the weaknesses might be, haven't actually thought about the threats. Often we just see the threats of today but not the looming threats of the future and have no idea where their opportunities lay to make extra profit, to increase their productivity, to even be happier as a family. So a basic SWOT analysis is such a great starting point in agricultural families to begin to be more strategic in their thinking. One thing which I think is really important is having a sound and robust decision-making framework. What I've been advocating for people is that you need to create a brains trust your business and these are the people that you bring in to brainstorm ideas. When you make a decision you actually need to have choices that you compare to then make an informed decision. If you're going to sow a particular crop species into a paddock you should be assessing all the other opportunities that you have ahead of you so that you know what's the intended gain from that decision or the anticipated loss. Because sometimes we have to make a decision to minimise loss. We all know we've bought you know, a penny cattle which didn't work out and you need to get out early to minimise your loss. So we have to have a good decision-making framework that we use. Probably one of the best decision-making frameworks that I have come across is actually within the holistic management decision framework. Now, it gives you a really robust way of testing decisions and making sure that they lead you towards the right economic outcome, you know, that it meets the social needs of everyone in the family, it, does it oppose your neighbours? Is it addressing the, the right weak link in the process? So it's a great framework. The next one is about passion, and this is the work of Ernesto Soroli. So I spent considerable time in the Midwest of the USA, across Kansas and Missouri, working with, or, look, or spending time with 
with enterprise facilitators that are working across that area. And they're not necessarily working with agricultural businesses, but they're working with families in small little rural towns, very similar to what we have in Australia. So I wanted to find out <coughs> what elements of passion, or sorry, how does passion impact, impact the different elements of, of agriculture? And these are some of the aspects that I've been able to identify just on the trip, and I'm sure there's probably others um, that also are impacted by passion. If we add into this mix the challenges of drought, economic trends, health problems, and so on, and if you aren't passionate at that point in time, it's probably going to lead for a really bad experience. So we have to be aware of passion burnout. Interesting thing that I found is that happy workers are 12% more productive and unhappy workers are 10% less productive. And what I think is interesting is that's about workers. I wonder what that is for actual people that own the business. I, I would probably tend to think that those figures might be even worse. So the work of Ernesto Sorolli around passion identifies that there is three elements of a business that people can be passionate about. There's the creation of the product, and most farmers tend to sit in that, that box. There's the marketing of the product, and there's the management of the finances. What Ernesto has found, in looking at all sorts of business people around the world, that no one can be passionate about all three. Some brilliant people, take for example Richard Branson, can be passionate about two, but let's accept the fact that we're not, we're not all like him. So we need to figure out where are we passionate about, and where is everyone else in the business passionate about? And then ask, have we got people in the right place? Passion is about what drives you to get out of bed. What inspires you to do what you do? This isn't, well, I have to do the books because no one else will do it. That's not passion. This is what actually makes you perform at your best. So I've used the Trinity Management model to test it on a couple of um, poor families out up in my, way, my region. So I'm going to show you what the results look like for one of the best fat lamb producing families in my region. Okay, and this, this is everyone in our community would agree that this is one of the best producing families. So, this is the Trinity management model expressed on a family. So, there's four people in this business mum, dad, the son, and the daughter in law. So, each person I ask them, I want you from a scale of zero to ten, how passionate. Are you about these three things in the business? It's not what it wasn't asking. What do you do? It's about passion. Then I also asked each person to scale. What's the performance of the business at present in these three areas? And then I took an average, and that's the bar that goes across. So I'll just tell you a little bit about this family. Mum does the financial stuff, although she hates it. She wants to retire to the city. Dad still jumps out of bed to go to work. He has never liked finances, so he doesn't help at all. I, I can see a few finger pointing going on. <laughs> he does not enjoy talking to people, so he isn't interested in marketing. The son's passionate about the farm that he's on, and he loves fat lambs just like Dad. He hates figures as well, and he left school at year 10. He loves talking to people, but hates having the, to sort of try and sell something to someone. He feels like he's a con man. The daughter-in-law doesn't know much about farming. She's a town girl and does not enjoy financial management, but loves marketing. She is very creative, loves people, is starting to study a marketing degree, but has not been included in this business. So if we have a look at this, we can see there's some pretty big issues looming for this family, who are deemed to be one of the best in my community. So it's important, know your passion, is everyone in the right place, and what can we read from information like this? Cultural capital is another key aspect. We need to have a look at the leadership in the business. Now leadership, I see, often we think that one person has to take on that role. But what I challenge you is actually do an audit of leadership in your business. You will find that everyone in the business brings a different leadership style. There's modern leadership and there's traditional leadership. What you need to ask is when under what circumstances do we need to tap into that leadership style of a person? And there's all sorts of stuff that you can read about leadership, but it's about knowing who the right person is at the right point in time to help lead the business through something. Work-life balance. In my research, 
The best businesses have work-life balance. Those families volunteer in their community, they play sport, they safeguard undertaking family activities together, and they holiday for at least three to four weeks as a block per annum. Important. Family communication. My slide's got a little spill um, thing out here, so sorry. But um, good family communication centres on exactly what Isabel Knight said yesterday. You have operational <coughs> meetings once a week, you have management meetings once a month, and you have strategic meetings quarterly. Everyone gets to have a say, everyone's respected for their views. There is so much information out there on how to build good family rapport, how to achieve consensus in business and family. And this is another aspect that I could give a talk on for, for an hour if you want. <coughs> Mental wellbeing. Research shows that if you are happy, you will have these things. And interestingly, happiness is determined by 50% of our genetics, up to 20% of our life circumstances, so our age, gender, marital status, income, our health. And then the other remaining 30% is simply on how we think and act. So we have such a big impact simply by the way that we think and act. So we need to make sure that we look after ourselves and everyone in that business. There's succession planning and I don't need to add any more on to what Isabel touched on yesterday. It's important, it's part of your family legacy and if you want to make a difference, you have to step up, be a leader in your business and deal with this stuff quickly so that you can make a big difference for everyone down the future and do it before there's death, disability, divorce or dispute. So that's a quick speed day with the key social factors that I've identified through the bursary project. As it is to, so important to manage your livestock health, your soil health, all those other elements, it's really important that you manage the health of your people in the business as well. And they're all the things that we have to look at together, not in isolation. Because if we don't, the biggest threat to Australian agriculture is the misunderstanding and mismanagement of the social factors that act as our barriers to progress and stop you from reaching your full potential. Now, if you'd like to know more about my full project, my report was just um, handed in to Riddick last week. Um, so hopefully it will go onto their website at some stage. But I do have, my details will be at the end. If you wanted to email me, I can send it to you direct. So I challenge to you is what is your bucket leaking? Have a look at it, find out what it is leaking and then be proactive in mending it. As an outcome from this bursary, I'm now working for the Department of Primary Industries to develop a social instrument that can help people audit where their strengths and weaknesses lie across these areas. So without the Rural Women's Award, I would not have been given this opportunity to undertake the bursary or to start undertaking this development of an instrument. So it's been the most extraordinary opportunity. And as I said, I now have a career path forward. But I just want to close by saying I have been absolutely inspired by this Nuffield Conference. You're a diverse family of forward-thinking change agents. You are what agriculture and agribusiness needs. We need more of it. You want success, you know the world is open to you, and you are hungry to exceed. Well done, Nuffield. Your legacy to agriculture is leaving a large, very positive footprint on agriculture, our communities, and the planet. So thank you very much for having me, and um, I hope you enjoy your field trips and the rest that you've got ahead of you. So thank you very much.